Today's topic is about attachment and part of the reason for that was a Singapore group came recently and they wanted to know about attachment. So this is a topic that's on my mind. I have a line that I really like and certain times when I'm reading things, lines jump out that really kind of resonate. My favorite line of all time is, how many beans make five? I think this is just a great line and it has a great meaning. Uh, but this line was, man is a machine that winds its own springs. And I really like that uh, idea because it sums up or captures uh, what's the experiences when we look into the mind. Uh, our job, or my job as a monk, as a meditator, is to be a mystic. So that was, that's my ambition, is to be a mystic. And <laughs> a few days ago, I was in my university and we had a conference with some Christians, about eight or nine Italian uh, missionaries who are here uh, to teach Christianity. And much of this actually was in Thai because they speak better Thai than they do English. So that was a bit bizarre to start with. And one of them seemed like a very, very nice chap, very nice man, kind of in his 60s, I guess, maybe 70s. And he said, I feel this love from God and I have this love for God and my ambition in life is to spread and share God's love in the world. He said, what's your ambition? I'm like, well, I want to like meditate. <laughs> Didn't seem like a very good response on my part. I couldn't suggest to them a really worthy kind of goal or what are we doing in, as Buddhists? What is our job? Well, our job is, as a, is to be a mystic. Our idea is that we are trying to capture or catch that mystery. And I did point out to the Catholic, Christian or Catholic group that in fact, you have mystics in Christianity also. In fact, every society around the world has always had its mystics. Those people who have withdrawn from society to a degree, have gone to caves, mountains, hillsides, and have sat down and have turned the attention inwards and gone into the mystery. And our question is, what is that mystery? What is the use or the benefit of it? Is it something that's worth pursuing? And all of the saints and sages who have come back and told us about this mystery have said it's worth pursuing. So we take it on a certain degree of trust that this um, this mystery that we enter into is something that will produce benefits, something that will be, in the end, joyous, even if it's difficult to arouse the energy and the effort to do the meditation. Now, that's what I wanted to be. Since I first heard about Buddhism, I wanted to be a mystic. Not in the sense of a you know, men like to feel that they have a deep sense of mystery about them, but is to enter into that actual living experience, that essence of life itself. The difficulty is that it doesn't really have any characteristics. So if you try and tell people, well, what is it that you are entering into? You get stuck for words. I very much like actually the Christian mystics, they call it union with God. I really like that. that, that just makes sense to me. I don't know who or what God is, 
I don't know really what enlightenment is, but I can enter into that kind of relationship. I can enter into that point in my mind. So when we turn the attention inwards, what you find is a maelstrom, if you know that word, like a tornado of thoughts and feelings and impressions. And most people think that they are unable to meditate because when they look at their mind in that way, that's what they find. There are a couple of responses to this. One response is to squash this cacophony and in, uh, enforce some kind of order onto it. And that's what we're doing when we do concentration meditation. When you concentrate on a color or a thought or an idea or a mantra, you're flattening out that cacophony of noise, that jumping around in the mind and replacing it with something that's more pure, more serene, more ordered, more systematic. And that's extremely comfortable. Once the mind crosses over, it's called a godrapu, or um, I like to use quantum leap because quantum mechanics, things have one state or another. There's no in-between states. That's why it's called quantum. There's a quantity. I'm probably going too far into that now, aren't I? Um, so Godrapu means a change of state. In the sutras you find it translated as change of lineage, which is a bit vague. But what it means is the mind exits from one mode of being and enters into another mode of being. And that's what happens when you suddenly click in concentration, when the mind suddenly drops everything and just enters in happily with its meditation object. Now, this was recommended by the Buddha. We often talk about concentration, or Vipassana teachers talk about concentration as being something that's a distraction or is not the holy life. And I'm thinking uh, of one particular monk who I met. He's one of these, he's very famous for psychic powers, very genuinely. And uh, he was talking about how he used to go walking meditation on the hillside in the temple. And he said these devas would come down and start hanging around. Is that what happens on your medi walking meditation? You have devas come, sing songs to you. Um, and then he would say to them, go away, you're disturbing my meditation. Yeah, that wouldn't be my response. I would be like, oh, wow, Deva. So, <laughs> I'm reminded of my, one of my favorite stories, some of you have heard it, of Papaji, Punjaji in uh, Lucknow. And he'd come out every day and answer people's questions. And one day, uh, he'd read from a book for a couple of hours and then answer questions. And one day, someone had written this question to him. She said, I was wandering in the forests behind Lucknow and I came across an abandoned temple and I sat there and Shiva appeared to me and did this incredible dance and every move of the dance was a communication that I understood perfectly and it went on and on and on for, in my opinion, a little bit too long. And then Shiva disappeared and I was left in a state of bliss and eventually I realized it's getting dark, it might not be safe and I found my way back to the place. What does this mean? And Papaji, he folds up this piece of paper in his beautiful, kind of enlightened manner. And he says, next time Shiva comes and appears to you, please tell him to come and see me because I haven't met him yet. <laughs> and that was it. That was the end of the question. <laughs> so I, I like that. It's a good lesson. Now, whether Devas do appear or whether Shivas do appear or whether you're hallucinating or tripping, is kind of beside the point. The point is not to get caught up in these kind of supernatural appearances. Well, concentration, these are the things that come when you, you practice high degrees of concentration. And uh, contrary to what many teachers teach, actually uh, concentration was considered to be a good and a beautiful and a beneficial practice in Buddhism. The Buddha repeatedly 
entreated his monks to practice concentration meditation. Uh, so this particular monk, he was saying how the devas would come and disturb him on his walking meditation and he would tell the devas to go away. He would practice these high states of concentration meditation, but in the end he said, this was all a waste of time because this isn't enlightenment. My frustration with that kind of teaching is, he may be enlightened, actually I have very good confidence that he's somebody quite highly attained. But the point was that concentration was his path, that was how he got to where he is now. And very often these saints, gurus and people who you see uh, and hear about who are enlightened, they only tell you about that last little key that they had to get into enlightenment. And they don't tell you about the lifetimes of practice that they've done before that. So, uh, constant, this one of the refrains that you hear in Buddhism is the concentration can be a distraction. Well, that wasn't the way the Buddha actually taught it. But if we're going to go past concentration, concentration will quell the maelstrom, quell the storm, and will appear as something very beautiful and very stable as you cross over into it. But sooner or later, you do have to come out of concentration, and then you're back in this same mind again. So where in this jumping stormy mind that we have, where in that is the stable ground? That's what we are looking for. And this is the mystery into which we are entering. Because as you delve, as you go further into the mind that's jumping around, what starts to happen is you see it in its real nature. And that is the nature of one thought coming up, what's for dinner, where am I going to go, yesterday I had this for dinner, next tomorrow I'm going to have that for dinner, so today I might have this for dinner, maybe I should get it in Villa, if I go to Villa where am I going to park, uh, shall I not take the car, I could take the Sky Train, have I got money in my Sky Train card, I should go up and I should, and, you, and you're off. And this will go on and on and on and you'll start somewhere and then 10 minutes later your, your mindfulness returns and now you're thinking about what are you thinking about? You're thinking about glaciers in Sweden. And you're like, how did I get from dinner to glaciers in Sweden? When an idea occurs to you, when something is conscious in the mind, it appears as something very important. It appears as something that needs to be thought about. And I've reflected on this time and time again because whenever something comes up in my mind, it seems like really important. Like, what's for dinner? It's like, well, I really need to figure that out. Even though 30 seconds ago I wasn't thinking about what's for dinner, worried about what's for dinner. This actually did occur to me because uh, yesterday I only had a, some mama had three slices of bread, mama, and I had some dried mushrooms and onion that I put in the mama. And that was my only food yesterday. So uh, today I'm looking forward, Prayatna has brought me some food, some proper food. And so on the way here, I was, well, last night I was calculating how many hours it had been since I'd eaten. And this was around six, seven o'clock, and I was feeling quite hungry by this time because this is about 30 hours that I'd only eaten one tub of mama. And suddenly it seemed really, really important to me. And looking around my room, have I got anything I can sneak? <laughs> and I didn't. No tins of anything. And I said, yeah, I could really do with something right now. Maybe I should have eaten more lunch. And it seemed really important. And then this morning I woke up, I realized that was 12 hours ago, that was 6 p.m., it's now 6 a.m., I haven't eaten anything for 12 hours and it hadn't even occurred to my mind. So how important was it when I was thinking about it at 6 p.m. last night? How important was it really? Did I really want to eat something? Or is this just something that's appeared in my mind and when something appears in your conscious attention, 
it appears with an, a, a quality of importance. You ever think about your old school friends, people you haven't seen for a long time, and how important that was when you were with them and now it just doesn't matter? Or a business company you used to work for an old job, and it seems when I worked as a chef, like I would spend like half my day thinking about the job and mostly about the annoying manager. We had a German manager, which isn't very, uh, it's not a very good combination. <laughs> and, I, and I would think about him quite a lot. He'd say some funny things and have some strange opinions. Frankly, I thought I could do the job better than he did. That's what it amounted to. And now I don't think about him. The only time he occurs to me is when I think about how little I think about him and how important it seemed at the time that I really have to think about that person. Whatever it is that appears in your conscious attention appears as something really important. And that importance is what we call attachment or I like to use the word lure. It's a lure that lures you in. It's a bait that will hook you into it. The Pali word that I'm thinking of here is not the usual translation of attachment, which is upadana. That has a slightly different meaning. Uh, but the Pali word nandi. And nandi means to delight in, uh, or it means to hold in your hand. And it can be something that is pleasant or unpleasant. The Pali word, when we say delighting in, it makes it sound like it's always something nice. But the Pali word has the connotation of nice or unpleasant. Because whatever it is that appears in the mind, it appears as really important. It appears like something I really need to think about. Yet when we look at the mind, we just find this like pumping of ideas after ideas after ideas after idea that always seems so important. And then 15 seconds later, actually that idea is gone and a new idea has come up. So how important was that thing that was in your mind 15 seconds ago? Reflecting in this way, you have to, sooner or later, ask the question, well, how, how important is all this nonsense that's just pumping through my mind? Constantly, religiously, relentlessly, seemingly important, but like, if it wasn't important 15 seconds ago, and this idea isn't going to be important in 30 seconds time, why do I give it importance now? I'm also thinking of my, the uh, school. I have couple of thousand schoolgirls outside my window, uh, which is not a very uh, pleasant experience. The actually, the schoolgirls are fine, it's the teachers. They get on the loudspeakers and they rant and everybody, you're not in a line, you didn't pick letter up in your room yesterday, stand to attention, sing a song, listen to this announcement, go over there, fill in this form. And this goes across the loudspeakers, like right across. My building has about 200 monks in it, so we blast straight into these 200 monks rooms. Of course, I don't care about 199 of those monks. <laughs> uh, schools are going to start again, I think Tuesday or something. Tuesday is going to all start, crank up again. I've had a couple of months of peace. When the teachers are going with this noise, usually starts about seven o'clock in the morning with music, horrible music, like at least play them some John Lee Hooker or something, you know, just, and I won't like it. And while I'm listening to it, I won't like it. And it'll go on for two hours, usually in the morning. But the thing that strikes me is I usually don't notice when it stops. It's very interesting that this thing that I find so unpleasant and I'll go on, I'll do my work, I'll update the websites and things like this. And then it'll come to 10 o'clock and I'll realize it stopped an hour ago and I never even noticed. How important was it when I was disliking it? If I don't even notice when it stopped. So the question is, what is the 
aside from this constant stream of stuff that's pounding on your door, knocking on your door, aside from that, that's the mystery. That's the feeling of just life itself. It's an undercurrent of clear, continuous presence. It's actually always there in every mind state that you can have, this feeling of life, of, you might say consciousness, but in Buddhism, <coughs> consciousness has a slightly different meaning. But in the English sense of just a continual conscious presence, awakeness, that's actually there behind every single state of mind. So what we're doing is, if we can break this feeling of importance of this stream of stuff, what starts to, you start to become aware of out of that is this continual presence that's just there. It's gentle, it's not exciting, it's not dull, it's not anything, but it's always there. And that's the mystery. That's the thing that we are trying to hook into, that we are trying to catch hold of. Now it's very abstract and that was why I was saying earlier, if you want to really become a meditator, you have to have some kind of puja, some kind of offering. Because this quiet presence that's so abstract, we have to try and make some kind of concrete relationship to it. But what happens is, the more that you can do that, and the more that you identify that undercurrent of simple presence, it's not a state of mind that you need to generate. It's what's there when you stop attaching importance to all the stuff that's churning through your mind. Then it's just there. It starts to appear and manifest as something that was always there. It's a bit like listening to me now, but hearing the air conditioner, it's always there, just gentle. You just don't notice it because uh, it's not striking enough. So this importance that we give to the stuff in the mind, it's that importance that is the obstacle. If we don't give importance to the stuff that's going through the mind, to this maelstrom, to this constant battering of ideas and thoughts and feelings and memories and impressions, if you don't give, uh, if we can break that importance, what happens is the attention will start to withdraw from all those machinations and will start to attach to the only thing that's left, which is this serene background presence. So it's a process of the... I, I like the Advaita, this is not a Buddhist um, idea, it's in part of the Enlightenment tradition of India, but uh, it came from Ramana Maharshi, I think, or it might be Nisargadatta, I get them mixed up. And he said it's like the inchworms. And the inchworms in India, they, they travel along the leaf and then they'll stand up on their rearmost legs and they'll twirl around on the leaves. And what they're doing is they, they want to leave the leaf that they're on, but they don't know where they're going to. So every so often they will reach up and they'll twirl around and eventually they'll catch hold of something. And when they catch hold of something, they'll let go of that original leaf. So Ramana Maharshi used this as a metaphor for our meditation, is the sense of self is withdrawing from one thing, which is this constant chatter, uh, machine gun firing of the mind, but is going to have to reach around before it can find something else to hold on to. And he described enlightenment as being finally what happens, the sense of self completely disengages from this stuff and then attaches to the unconditioned or the amata or the enlightenment. <clears throat> so this is our job with the, uh, I'm using the word importance here, but the Pali word is nanti or delighting in or attaching to, because the things that appear in the mind appear as something that's important. They lure you in and they try to grab your attention. In fact, the job of a human being usually is out of this chaos. We try to find something 
stable, but we do it in the wrong way. We do it by forming an ego, right? We want to make some kind of story which will make sense of this constant chatter in the mind. And we attach onto the stories because the stories give you some kind of stable ground, some way of relating to yourself. I was watching a documentary on Alaska a while back and this guy was going out hunting. He's very fit. And the camera crew that follows him around are not able to keep up with him because he's really kind of fit and strong. And he's going way out into the outback in Alaska. And it's quite dangerous. I mean, there's lots of bogs and pit holes and you can break your leg, break your neck. And uh, they said to him, like, you can just die out here. If you twist your ankle and you're, you know, six hours walk into the bush, you, you're finished. And he, he said, shall I try and do an Alaskan accent? I'm, I'm not really going to. A mountain man I was born, a mountain man I am, and a mountain man I sure as hell will die. It's the best I can do. <laughs> I'm not good at accents. <clears throat> this is a story that he's attaching to, right? And not just any story, this is life and death. This is him uh, going out hunting bear, and I felt a bit sorry for the bears, but, um, you know, he can die out there. Well, he has a story that will carry him through. And this is a way to make sense of what essentially, when you look at it in your mind, doesn't make very much sense. And so this is what uh, psychology is all about, is how do you make sense of this constant stuff? How do you put it into order? How, do you, how can you find some good stories from which you can, which are better stories to operate from? There is actually a modern brand of psychology. Uh, it's called narrative psychology. Um, Dan McAdams is the main guy. I, I've tried several times reading the text on this, but I find them very wishy-washy. What they do is they interview people and try to find what are the stories that people live by. But what you end up with then is just like a different story for every person, and it doesn't give you much guidance, in my opinion. So I've been very disappointed so far in the psychology of the narrative self. This narrative self is the self that we need to let go of. When in Buddhism we're talking about non-self, we're talking about ways to undermine that sense of your story, yourself. You actually don't need it. You will operate fairly well in the world without these narratives uh, to hang on to. Much better than you probably think you would. Um, I found my life as a monk, when you're a junior monk, you really try hard to be like monk-like. <laughs> you know, you, when you're talking to people, you want to try and be monk-like and you see it with the Thai monks. They do it very beautifully, actually, a very beautiful thing. But when they come to the temple and they come in and they're kind of just like, usually guys, 20, 22 years old, finish school, don't really want to be in the temple, they'll do their bit, make some merit for the family. Uh, and then they go through the ordination procedure and then suddenly they're like, and walking around very serene and very proper. And whereas 10 minutes before they were kind of like this in front of their parents, now suddenly they're like, because <laughs> you're taking on a role and you are taking on a role, and it is important to, to do that. If you're going to ordain as a monk, you can't behave the way you were behaving before. So I don't want to criticize that that's not what they should do. I do wonder what I looked like when I became a monk. Um, to me now, it's actually just kind of, I can't remember being any other way. Most of my adult life was spent as a monk. So uh, taking on that kind of role uh, it does become important, especially when you become in, coming into the public eye. Uh, that's also 
uh, important. You have to take on that persona. And you do it yourself, right? You will have a certain persona as a parent with your children, which is a bit different to your persona with your husband or your wife, which is a bit different to your persona with your boss. Um, this kind of psychology I quite like. This was uh, George Kelly, uh, personal construct theory, and he talked a lot about roles. And he was one of the ones that introduced the idea in therapy that you can actually start taking on different roles and practicing these roles with your therapist. Well, with our Buddhist practice, meditation practice, we're undermining this entire sense of self. You actually don't need it. And the more you drop all of these kind of roles and ideas, uh, the more ordinary you become. And if you ever meet some of these really like well-attained monks and teachers, they're often extremely ordinary people. So ordinary is quite strange. <laughs> so we undercut these stories and personas that we invent to make sense of this maelstrom of stuff. The maelstrom or the storm of stuff is a constant barrage of things that appear important while they're right there in front of you. But when we reflect on it, actually it's not important. It just appears important because you have your spotlight on it. Watching it in that way, you start to lose your attachment. And this is what is meant by non-attachment. When we talk about non-attachment in Buddhism, People try to make it into a thing. Well, I've heard people say, well, you should be attached. You should still do things, but not be attached to the results of things. And that's non-attachment. Does that make sense? I mean, it, it, psychologically, it's not a bad idea, right? You make an effort, but you should be willing to accept whether your effort succeeds or fails doesn't help when you're writing a thesis. <laughs> so people have tried to make sense of this idea of non-attachment, but if you're not attached to your health and your pension and your, your family and, and your job and uh, in your visa, I mean, these are all things that you have to do in life. You have to have a, an amount of attachment to them. Your role as a parent or as a monk or as a husband or a wife, I mean, you have to have attachments to those roles. Otherwise, you're not taking it seriously. You're not going to fulfill those roles properly. So in my view, when we talk about non-attachment, it's non-attachment in your life is life things that you have to take care of doesn't make very much sense. But non-attachment when you're entering into the mystery, when you're entering into that feeling that lies behind all the movement of the mind, that makes perfect sense. Because the one thing, when that mystery starts to reveal itself, the one thing that you see about it is it's not all that churning stuff. And the thing that hides it is this sense of importance with whatever is occurring in your mind. If you can break that sense of importance with the things that are arising in your conscious attention, then that mystery starts to reveal itself much, much more easily and more beautifully. So this is what we're doing when we do meditation. Uh, I set my alarm, my buzzer for one hour, 40 minutes, because it's 99 minutes and that's lucky in Thailand. So. 99 minutes and usually the first 99 minutes isn't that nice. It takes me a long time to get my meditation started. Partly because if you meditate for long periods of time, the meditation doesn't feel very important because you're going to be doing it all day. Uh, if you've got 15 minutes, then you, your meditation, you want to make it important and you put in more effort. So that's one thing I've noticed with myself. If I'm meditating before I go to university or something and I've got 15 minutes, that's a really good 15 minutes because I put my bag into it. As all this stuff comes up in my mind and it seems really important, I want to think about the boxing, I want to think about 
my room, I want to think about books that I want to write, YouTubes that I want to make, videos that I want to edit, all this stuff. This stuff comes from habit. That's what the all psychology is about, really. It's about how this habit forms. Stuff comes up because you've thought about it before and given it importance before. If you can break that importance to all this stuff that's coming up, the mystery, the thing that lies behind it, starts to reveal itself as very clear and very present. And this is what mindfulness actually is. Mindfulness is often presented as being mindful of what you are doing. That's, that's like stage one, that will help you. But mindfulness in the original context was sati sampajanya. Sati means to recollect. Sampajanya is the feeling of your own awareness. If you can recollect the feeling of your own awareness, this is stable ground and will appear as stable ground, will appear as something beautiful once you absorb into it. Now that is a very definite and clear experience, so we're not rejecting all experience. We're rejecting all of this churning of the mind. So this is the uh, meaning of attachment and non-attachment. I would offer up to switch the word attachment uh, for the word importance or the word delighting in, nanti. It means holding something in your conscious attention. That's the thing that we are trying to, that's the habit that we are trying to break. After that, then the mystery starts to present itself, becomes clearer and clearer. I have a lot of stuff in my mind, just as you have a lot of stuff in your mind. But after a while of watching it, watching, watching, and then you catch those moments when the mind stops churning and you're like, Oh, that's right. I have a metaphor or analogy um, which I want to finish off on and this was a something from the Tibetan book of living and dying and they're talking about the bardo states which are states that appear after you die and before you take a rebirth. Now whether that is true or not true, I, I'm not interested, I'm using this as a metaphor. But what they say is that after you die, because you don't have the physical body slowing things down, what happens is when a beautiful thought occurs to you, beautiful state starts to arise, you become immensely beautiful and angelic and deva-like. But when an angry, or greedy or unwholesome thought appears to you, you become completely un, completely greedy, unangelic, and you become like a monster. And apparently this is the experience, this is what they're describing as the experience, will be so unstable, jumping around from one thing to another thing, and your mind will take on these gigantic proportions because there's nothing slowing it down. We have our physical bodies to to matter, to slow things down, give you a kind of sense of stability. But after you die, your mind just goes so completely wild, nothing to hold it back. And this is why in Buddhism they say that the moment after you die is, is a period where you can become enlightened if you've done a lot of practice. We don't normally teach in that way because, you know, you come and do your practice with me and then after you die, you'll be all right, you know. We want to stay away from that kind of um, thing. You know, it's like, give me all your money and I'll put it into a bank account and then when you die, you can withdraw it. In the meantime, I've got all your money. So we tend to stay away from those kind of teachings, but they are there. And they do say that when you die, there is a moment where you can have a high potential for attaining enlightenment because the mind is so powerful. But as your mind switches between angels and monsters, flipping from one extreme to the other extreme, according to the book, out of all of this will appear a soft blue light. And the soft blue light will appear attractive because it's stable. And so your attention goes into that soft, stable blue light. 
And once you enter into that blue light, you've entered into a womb and into a rebirth, and you're going to be born as a new creature. Now, I can't verify that that's what will happen. Is it a blue light? What, a, what happens if you die and then you see a, like a, a yellow light? You're like, well, is that, the, is that the right light or is that the wrong light? Do I, like, where do I go? <laughs> uh, so, you know, I, I don't want to suggest what you do when you die. I don't know myself. But I really liked this. I do have faith and I do have a trust in Buddhism. And I like this as a metaphor because in the meditation, this is how the mystery starts to appear. Out of this maelstrom of monsters and demons and angels and beautiful and hateful states of mind that come rattling through, shaking my cage, telling me I'm important, I'm important, appears this soft, gentle, just awareness, simple awareness and presence. That's the mystery. That's what we are trying to get hold of in the meditation. When you sink into that, once in a while, the mind will stop. And this becomes quite clear. This is a godrapu. This is a change of lineage. It's very clear when you exit from that state into the, this new state. From that new vantage point, you can still see the mind churning away, but it has zero importance. It doesn't really matter anymore what the mind is doing. You don't need, enlightenment isn't going to be creating a new state of mind because you can see all of that stuff going. And here this is very simple, very clear and present. So that's where Ajahn Chah described it nicely. He said, you have your, you're crossing over a stream or a brook, but you didn't commit to jumping over. And you wound up with one leg on one bank and one leg on the other bank and not being able to go in either direction. So it's just such a great metaphor, right? Because you're in the mystery, but you can see the mind churning. You haven't quite crossed over yet. So the second stage of it is when you actually cross straight over and you're just in that bright stillness presence. At that point, there's absolutely nothing left to do. You say, well, this is the path. It becomes very clear. What's interesting that I find is the mind of the self and the ego and self-identity isn't there at that point. When you come out of the meditation, usually you get on and you're doing your stuff and you're working in the world. And then you suddenly like, hang on a minute. When I was meditating, there was something really important there. But you see, I wasn't there. I can't remember it. I wasn't present because this whole me is something that's all created up. So bit by bit, it starts to filter into your consciousness and you get more and more of a trust. Like, oh yeah, I know what happens now when I let my entire self go. And I know that it's beautiful. In those times, what I find is I become like happy for no reason. I'm not a happy person, generally. I'm a whinger. Well, I'm English, right? We grumble, we moan. You know, that's what we like to do. But what I find funny is there's just this kind of happiness kind of upwells for no reason within me. And it's remembering that because I've, re I've seen that mystery. I've been in that mystery. So I'm going to leave it there today. This was the topic, attachment and non-attachment, because these Singaporeans that came to see me, that was their question. Why is it that you want to practice non-attachment? Isn't that the crazy thing to do? The answer is yes, you have to be attached to the things of the world and life. But in meditation, it makes perfect sense. Okay, we're going to leave it there. If anyone has a question or a comment.